Can I begin uh, with you, Ms. Uh, Davis, please? Now, I understand that Ofcom is investigating one episode of uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg's programme. Why only one? Um, so we set out yesterday uh, that we are investigating one uh, programme on GB News and one on Talk TV, um, in addition to the ongoing investigation we have in relation to GB News. Um, we look at every single complaint in the same way, either individual complaint or multi comp multiple complaints, and we look at them in relation to our rules and take a decision on whether to investigate or not. Is the problem, of course, with Jacob Rees-Mogg's programme isn't a single episode, it's the ongoing nature of the programme. Now, how do we look at your press release that you issued when explaining why it was that you were going to investigate this one episode of Mr Mogg's programme? He gave an absurd commentary about uh, Donald Trump being found innocent of sexual molestation charges, which, of course, is not the case at all, as we know. And this is what your press release said. We're investigating whether this programme broke our rules, which prevent politicians from acting as newsreaders unless exceptionally it is editorially justified. That's the quote from the Ofcom press release. But of course that's not what your rules say at all. What your rules actually say is no politician may be used as a newsreader, interviewer or reporter in any news programme unless exceptionally it is editorially justified. Now, there's a bit of spin going on there from Ofcom, I feel. Uh, your press release said that politicians couldn't act um, as newsreaders, but your rules actually say that they can't act as newsreaders or interviewers or reporters. And, of course, Mr Mogg, on every single programme that he presents, Monday to Thursday, goodness knows, how on earth can a full-time MP find the time to do a news programme four days a week when he should be working for his constituents. But setting that to, to one side, he interviews every day of the week, thus breaking your rules. Um, I'm not going to comment on an individual case. It would be inappropriate for me to do so. Um, no, I'm not asking you to comment that on that rules. particular programme. I'm asking you to comment on the genre of, uh, of active politicians presenting <coughs> news programmes, as Mr Mogg does every single day? So, what I can comment on is our rules, which say, firstly, as you rightly quote, uh, that no politician may be used as a newsreader, interviewer or reporter in a news programme, unless exceptionally editorially justified. And there is obviously also rules around uh, people who are standing uh, for election and that they cannot uh, present at all. Um, there is also a... a clear distinction between news and current affairs and our rules around due impartiality cover both news and current affairs and we have set out further details in terms of what you might expect in a news programme versus what you might expect in a current affairs programme. Yes, let's look at that in a second, but he's doing a news programme. I mean, the, the clue is in the name, GB News. It's a news, pro it's a news programme. He does interviews. Now, your rules say that uh, politicians cannot do interviews. Uh, unless exception, under exceptional circumstances. He does interviews every single day. He's we, breaching your rules. We don't judge. Why uh, not? It's your job to judge. Do you let me finish my answer? Uh, we don't judge a programme based on the name of the programme. We judge it based on the content and the way it's treated and how a broadcaster chooses to adhere, or, or not, uh, to the due impartiality and due accuracy rules. And may yes, I add... No, I'll, I'll pursue that for a second, then I'll, I'll come to you. But there's no uh, due impartiality in Mr Mogg's programme. Every single day, he uh, churns out the same old right-wing pro-Brexit stuff. What he's doing is blurring uh, news presenting and commentary. He does that every single day of the week. Your rules, I read out your rules to you, I won't do it again, they're very explicit. It has to be exceptional circumstances for an MP to do interviews. He interviews every single day of the week. He's breaching your rules. It's not a one-off, it's every day. Why don't you act to stop this? If the programme constitutes a news programme, that is the rule. If it constitutes a current affairs programme, we look at it differently. This is we dancing at the head of a pin, because uh, as a former news presenter myself, I know that news programmes often contain longer format interviews, 
which could become current affairs programmes. I used to present BBC Breakfast. I would do long interviews every day. But it wasn't a current affairs programme. It was like Mr Mogg's programme, a news programme. He is presenting a news programme, not a current affairs programme. He breaches your rules. I don't have anything further to say. I've been clear on how we take our... Okay, well, I had a little look at um, what uh, Kevin Backhurst... Now, I should explain, Kevin Backhurst is the group director uh, in Ofcom. Maybe I could turn to you, Ms Biggs. Here are the rules. Um, You cannot, apparently, according to Mr Backhurst, you cannot speak directly to the camera. If you do that, it's then a current affairs... Uh, It's then a news show, not a current affairs show. Let me show you a picture. There is Mr Mogg speaking directly to the camera. He does this every day. Now, Kevin Backhurst, who's one of your most senior figures, lists in his blog a number of rules that will make a programme, a news programme, rather than a current affairs programme. The first one is speaking directly to the camera. I've just shown you Mr Mogg speaking directly to the camera with a scrolling news bar underneath. Now, that's the grammar of a news programme. Would you accept that? There's a couple of things there. Just a a point of clarification. Kevin Backhurst has recently left Ofcom. He's been appointed as the DG for RTE in Ireland. But you're not resiling from what he said. Uh, no, so I'm just, I'm just providing that as a clarification, just uh, so members are aware. The second thing, a breach of our rules, whether that's a breach of due impartiality on a news programme or a current affairs programme, is incredibly serious, and we take that breach as very seriously. As uh, my colleague mentioned, we launched an investigation into that particular show. Well, a particular show. I don't know if it's exactly the one that you've just he shown does it every night. Screen. So it would be inappropriate for us to potentially... Uh, inhibit or affect an ongoing investigation. I hear what you're saying about the concerns around our definitions in both our code and guidance. They are things that we keep under review. We are cognizant of changing audience appetite. We're also cognizant of audiences' expectation to access a range of content, and that includes magazine-style programmes, that includes current affairs and news, and there's a number of news channels that contain current affairs or more magazine That's fine. If you want to change the rules, change the rules. If you want to say that Tory MPs or any other party's MPs can present programmes, change the rules. My point is that it's blindingly obvious to anybody watching that channel or listening to our proceedings today, it's blindingly obvious that they breach the rules, not just in a single individual programme that you're investigating, but every day. So I've shown you one breach of the rules, speaking directly to the camera. Here's what else Mr Backer said. He said that shows with MPs presenting shouldn't have running orders or a series of stories at the top of the show. Now, I endured a couple of episodes of Mr Mogg's programme uh, just by way of research. He always has a running order and a series of stories at the top of the show. So that's another one of Ofcom's rules breached. Um, they should not cut to live reporters. He also cuts to live reporters. Should not conduct news interviews. He also conducts news interviews. Every single one of Mr Backhurst's Ofcom tests... Jacob rees breaches every single day of the week, and yet you're only investigating one programme. We'd be very happy to update the committee when the investigation concludes. Right. I mean, it looks to me as if you want to expand your powers, or you've been asked potentially to expand your powers, but you can't even cope with what you've got on at the moment, let alone expanding. Can I go back to you, uh, Ms Davis? Now, um, Your boss, uh, Melanie Dawes, uh, appeared before us previously. Now, she seemed quite confused when I asked her about Tory MPs interviewing the Tory Chancellor on a Tory budget. She hadn't seen the programme. Um, I I watched back her interview. It didn't go well uh, for her. She didn't seem clear about whether or not it breached the Ofcom rules. Um, Now, this was Esther and Phil show, Esther McVeigh and Philip Davis. You started investigating on the 3rd of April. It's now May, June, July. It's 12 weeks on. 
Why haven't you announced the results of your investigation? Um, so, as we've already said, I'm not going to comment on the live case, um, but we are progressing a, a, as quickly as we are able to. As Kate already mentioned, a breach of our code is a very serious thing. Um, we have to balance freedom of expression, and, and we don't take a decision to breach a broadcaster on that, those grounds lightly. Freedom of expression for both the broadcaster and the audiences. Um, we, you know, we, so we're, we're taking the time we need to make the right decision. Well, it's far too long, isn't it? Twelve weeks. It's a very simple matter of principle. Whether or not MPs are allowed to breach your rules and get away with it, night after night. Now, there's not, no more egregious breach of your rules, which I've read out, than a Tory Chancellor being interviewed by Tory MPs, and that programme trailed on a news channel by the Treasury. We've just lost all sight of objective journalism, and it's your guy's job to enforce the rules, and you're not doing it. And we're going to proceed down a route till we end up with awful American style ranting at the camera. We're already seeing it, all masquerading as news. I think we, the one point to, to add before perhaps we, we go on to the sections around the media bill and our views on those would be we take our responsibility to protect the trusted, impartial, and accuracy of television and radio news very seriously. I hear what you're saying, but that's exactly why we need to take these investigations thoroughly. I know you hear what I'm decisions saying. Decisions known publicly, because they do set a precedent for other editors. On it certainly the does. You, you say you're hearing what I'm saying. I've been saying this for months and months and months, and it seems to me that Ofcom is constantly following and trying to catch up. You're not setting the pace, which is your job. Um, can I move on very quickly to the issue of, of languages? because language is, is also considered in the media uh, bill. And it seems a little bit opaque, the issues uh, around languages. Um, Ms Davis, perhaps you could tell me, what are the rules on language provision under uh, the new legislation? Um, are you talking about the minority languages yes. part? Um, uh, so, look... I I think it's really important that the bill recognises uh, the importance of minority languages ac across the UK um, uh, and you know, that we will in future be able to look at whether there is sufficient provision of, of minority languages across PSBs when we what undertake is sufficient our provision? Um, so I think we will need to look at that when we undertake our review of public service broadcasting. We need to look at it in the round, look at what audiences ex expect. We regularly research into what audiences ex expect and what they need. Uh, the public service broadcasters need to provide content that is diverse uh, and meets the needs of audiences right across the UK, and clearly minority languages are a part of that. That's all incredibly vague. Um, how, how, do you know how many hours of Scots language broadcasting there is at the moment? Can I pass to you? Um, I would have to check because, I mean, you're talking around community radio through to, you know, the major PSBs and Scots and Ulster Scots, so I'd have to check and write to the committee. I can tell you, none. None. Not a single hour. Do you know what Scots language is? Yes. Can you define it for me out of interest? Um, it is uh, of cultural relevance to a significant minority of people in Scotland. It is a minority language recognised in the UK, along with Ulster Scots, Gaelic and Welsh. Hmm. It doesn't really have any status at all. It's not on the passports. Um, it's, it's not even an official language in, in the Scottish uh, Parliament. There's no hours of broadcasting in it at all. It's a first cousin of uh, English uh, related to Frisian and other languages. But this idea that there should be sufficient quantity I noticed that neither of you can define what sufficient quantity is. It's completely vague, and it seems to me to be um, a, a good idea in principle. Um, but zero thought has gone into the provision or what it actually means. So I think a lot more work needs to be done on this.